श्री गुरुभ्यो नम हरि ओ असतो मा सद्गमय तमसो मा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय ओ शांति 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 वेलकम टू द सन्डे सर्विस ऑफ द वेदांत सोसाइटी ऑफ टोरांटो and today we have a special uh, sunday service with uh, swami tattvayanand ji as the speaker this is little different than we had uh, originally announced in the newsletter but we had later rectified uh, swami tattvayanand is currently the minister of the vedanta society of northern california san francisco originally founded by swami vivekananda in 1900 he underwent traditional training in hindu scriptures sanskrit vedic vedantic literature for many years from his early days he served in various centers of the ramakrishna order in india as editor publisher and teacher of sanskrit advaitic texts such as sri shankaracharya's commentaries on the prasthanatraya uh, the fundamental sanskrit texts of vedanta philosophy buddhism and indian philosophy Before coming to the United States in January 2012 he was teaching Sanskrit Vedantic scriptures and Indian philosophy at the training center in Velurmat the institution that trains the monks of the Ramakrishna order at the headquarters of the Ramakrishna mission Kolkata India apart from his traditional education the swami has also received modern university education in English literature psychology european history and western philosophy he is frequently invited for lectures on yoga vedanta and traditional hindu scriptures and the, and for participating in interfaith dialogues this is uh, swami tattvayanand ji is with the head of our Fra- san francisco center it is his uh, uh, recorded um, speech and it is that topic is advaita vedanta according to sri ramakrishna and sri shankaracharya so you are welcome to the talk by swami tattvayananda of the vedanta society of northern california san francisco i am recording this um, i am speaking this um, video uh, from the shrine of the vedanta society san francisco now swami tattva mayananda ji om sthapakay ch dharmasya sarva dharmasya rupine avatar varishthaya ramakrishnay te namaha shruti smriti purananam alayam karunalayam namami bhagavat padam shankaram loka shankaram <clears throat> i will tell you something very interesting which is very relevant for our times there is a special reason why uh, i was tempted to uh, suggest this interesting topic uh, in the us uh, for the last 12 years almost 12 years i was giving lectures in different places on different topics and a few very serious american academics approach me and perhaps you know i used to have close associations with different uh, learner circles in this country especially among the um, science scholars please uh, understand i am not a very young person i am 66 year old sometimes you may think a youngster sitting in front of us talking about vedanta but i have attended vakya tsadas Uh, mostly in circles of uh, exclusive science scholars so a few american academics approached me and discussed something very interesting with me the subject was this in us today and also in europe there is a tendency to appropriate india's cultural spiritual scriptural uh, properties appropriation of our heritage in the us almost every month half a dozen books are being written 
on mindfulness. They never ever mention Buddha's name. Mindfulness is actually based on two of Buddha's well-known discourses in Pali. Maha Sadhi Upattana Sutta, it's a bigger version and shorter version, Sadhi Upattana Sutta. They never mention Buddha's name. They talk about mindfulness. As if mindfulness is, is a product by an American company. Such an atrocious. On the other hand, you know, these, these topics were raised with me by American scholars. And they named a few Indian scholars who are trying to interpret India's spiritual heritage as if it is an American product. It is not, nothing less than pure intellectual, spiritual, philosophical treason. So, so I started a series of classes for the Sanford Archives. It's called the Foundational Text of Indian Philosophy. And I include uh, Rigveda Samhita Mantras, Aranika Mantras. I also include many, many uh, portions of all the four Vedas. And uh, in fact, the original text of the six Astika Darsanas, Purva Mimamsa, Uttara Mimamsa, Nyaya Vaisyajika, Sankhya Yoga, and the six Nastika Darsanas, Vijnana Vada, Shunya Vada, Sautrantika, Vibhashka, Bauddha tradition, Charvaga, and Jaina tradition. Because they want to make, they want to uh, tell interested circles that this constitutes India's unique ancient, spiritual, philosophical, cultural inheritance. So that's the, by the way. Now coming to subject. Talking about Advaita, the Advaita experience of Sri Ramakrishna. May we begin uh, with the statement. Truth is neither old nor new. It is eternal. It called Sharvikana Atida, Trikala Abadhida. It doesn't have a past, present, and future. It is eternal and unchanging. Advaita, or Advaitic experience, as experienced by Sri Ramakrishna, is only one aspect of Advaita. But the Advaita experience, according to Swami Vivekananda, is experience alone. Uh, when I, before uh, entering the subject, I shall give a brief uh, description of Sri Ramakrishna's Advaitic experience, which all of you know very well. You know how Totapuri came to the Ekshinishwa and suggested to Sri Ramakrishna that he should practice Advaita. Sri Ramakrishna was a bit reluctant at the very beginning. He went to Mother's temple, got permission, and he agreed. And finally, Sri Ramakrishna uh, was trained in this discipline of Advaita by Totapuri, who belonged to one of the ten monastic orders of monks that Shankaracharya founded. Totapuri is one of the ten monastic orders. You have to remember, Shankaracharya is the founder of ten monastic orders. Sister Nivedha in her book says, she compares Shankaracharya's contribution to the contributions of Ignatius Loyola, St. Francis of Assisi, Aberon, and many of the Christian theologians like Aquinas, Augustine, and so on. Then he says, Shankaracharya rode in one personality, Aquinas, Augustine, Ignatius Loyola, and all the great mystical writers of Christian poet, mystical tradition, poetical tradition. He wrote the most profound Sanskrit works in uh, philosophical books in Sanskrit. He's the writer of the most profound the most moving devotional poems, no less than 68 devotional poems. Some of them are like, see, Gadistam, uh, Gadistam, Tomeka, Bhavani. I tell you something very interesting. Long ago, one person who actually sang this bhajan, Mother, you are the only refuge, the meaning of it. He asked me why Shankaracharya did not uh, respect devotion they told him, you know the song that you sang today? One of our own monks. Gadistam, Gadistam, Tomega, Bhavani. It was written by Shankaracharya. And none of the bhakti teachers could ever write anything comparable to some of the most profound devotional poems of Shankaracharya. Even the puja that we are practicing today. 
ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಚತುಷಷ್ಟಿ ಉಪಚಾರ ಪೂಜಾ ಸ್ತೋತ್ರ ವಿಹ ಪಂಚದೇವದ ಪಂಚೋಪಚಾರ ದಶೋಪಚಾರ ಷೋಡಶೋಪಚಾರ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ರೋಟ್ ಎ ಪೋಯಮ್ ವಿಚ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರೈಬ್ಸ್ ಸಿಕ್ಸ್ಟಿ ಫೋರ್ ಉಪಚಾರಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಪೂಜಾ ಪದ್ಧತಿ ಇಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ಡ್ ಸೊ ನೌ ಶ್ರೀರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಾಸ್ ವಾಸ್ ಬಿ ಟ್ರೈನ್ ಬೈ ತೋತಾಪುರಿ ಇನ್ ಅದ್ವೈತಿಕ್ ಡಿಸಿಪ್ಲಿನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಫೈನಲಿ ಶ್ರೀರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ went through all the rituals and then totapuri uh, gave this mahavakya upadesha tattva masi upadesha vakya and immediately sri ramakrishna had this experience and that is aham brahmasmi anubhuti so tattva masi you are that absolute reality the brahman the atman that is from chandogya it is you know chandogya upanishad you find the sixth chapter from ninth khanda to 16th khanda there are nine nine statements of tattvamasi one upadesha and eight repetitions with eight drishtandas or examples immediately sri ramakrishna experienced that when the upadesha was given immediately sri ramakrishna experienced that now again for normal people let's say ramana maharshi ramana maharshi was an advanced sadhaka he got this uh, the you know this something happened in his life his father died that incident made him think where did my father go what happened to his body he was here yesterday today is not there and that thought prompted him to leave his home he came to tirunamalai he did sadhana for a long time and he also realized advaita anubhuti ramana maharshi's teachings are based on the same advaita philosophy of shankaracharya so sri ramakrishna got this experience in a split second of course before that you know i, I don't want to repeat the story when totapuri was trying to uh, uh, move sri ramakrishna to the highest anubhuti there was an obstacle mother's picture mother's image came then totapuri looked around took a small uh, piece of crystal pierced it on his forehead bhoo madhya immediately sri ramakrishna immersed in samadhi and he woke up for he came out of samadhi only after 3 days totapuri himself took 40 years to have that experience he disciple took only 3 days on the other hand ramana maharshi he also studied vedanta he had already read books on vedantic ideas but the incident of his father's passing away prompted him to go deeper into that idea he left his home he practiced spiritual sadhana for a long time as many advanced sadhakas do but he was a great sadhaka in his past life he also reached this experience in a vedantic tradition there are two schools of advaitic experience belonging to two sampradayas one is called shabda parokshavada the other is called prasankhyanavada now of course as a background i would state further you know in the uh, in the advaitic tradition uh, during the post shankarai times three prasthanas three traditions three schools of vedantic vedanta philosophy emerged it is called vivarna prasthana bhamadi prasthana and vartika prasthana Vivarana Prasthana derives its name from a well-known book called Panchapadhika Vivarana. It is a commentary on Panchapadhika by Patnabhada, one of Shankaracharya's disciples. And then, of course, after that, this Vivarana Pramaya Samgraha, uh, you know, other, other, other great scholars uh, emerged with the Aranya road, Vivarana Pramaya Samgraha and so on. So, this is one school of thought called Vivarana Prasthana, belonging to Patnabhada, Prakasa Mayadi and others. There is another prasthana, school. It's called Bhamadi Prasthana. It derives its name from a book called Bhamadi Tika. It is a commentary on a large portion of Shankaracharya's Bhashya by Vajaspati Misra, who according to many scholars, lived almost during Shankaracharya's times. He was an elder contemporary according to some schools and a younger contemporary according to some other schools. He lived in Mithila in today's Behav state. He wrote a commentary called Bhamati and then 
a great scholar who came later wrote bhamadi kalpataru then appaya dikshita wrote kalpataru parimala so these are two streams of vedantic or advaitic experience or interpretative schools of advaitic experience in traditional vedantic circles there is a third school is called abhasavada vartika prasthana which belongs to sureshwar acharya it derived its name from uh, uh, brahadar nubanishad bhashya vartikam we say lord's poetical interpretation on shankaracharya's bhashya on brahadar nubanishad but abhasavada we call vartika prasthana and padmavada system they merged into one so both of them accepted this what we call uh, vivarana prasthana or world shabda parokshavada no i shall try to explain this what is shabda parokshavada which is followed by sureshara padmavada prakasha medhi and uh, and other vidyaranya and others it means when you listen to a mahavakya tattvamasi immediately aham brahmasmi anubhuti will spring in your mind it's a very important thing that's what happened to sira mahishna and according to many shankara dikvijayas the same thing happened to shankara acharya when he was instructed by by govinda bhagavad pada he was only 7 years old at that time what it means is suppose you are fully equipped with sadhana sadushta sampatti that is nitya aditya vastu vibeka ikamutra phala bhoga viraga samadhi sukha sampatti mumukshuttu these are the primary qualifications for studying vedanta understanding vedanta properly when we study a vedanta book vedantic book people tell is all rubbish you know because they are not fit for that if you take an engineer to a medical school and force him to listen to medicine a lesson on medicine that fellow thing medicine is absolute rubbish again you take an engineer with the engineering school he will say engineering is absolute rubbish if you are not interested in music and if i force you to learn music lessons every day you will hate the musician you will also hate music you will also hate your father who forced you to learn music i mean we even physically assault him is a terrible torture to have to study something to listen to something for which you are not ready so what happens is when you are fully ready for vedanta shravana shravana is the uh, fifth discipline in vedanta first nitya uh, nitya vastu veka this all of you may know a sense of discerning wisdom between real and unreal and a sense of renunciation a sense of mental restraint and self discipline six items and a strong urge for liberation or spiritual enlightenment mumukshutu when you have all these four qualifications then you do shravana you go to a library you read a book that is also shravana shruyate idi shravanam actually shravanam doesn't mean listening though there's a literal meaning it means feeding your mind with an idea is shravanam when you are ready to listen or to understand to read and listen to vedanta then you will understand what vedanta is if you have scored very high marks in fifth class fifth standard and you go and sit the sixth class the first lesson you learn it very well now so shravana manana is the next discipline and nididhyasana internalization meditation the meaning of what you heard shravanartha mananam and nididhyasana suppose you have done all this all your life and somebody tells you or you somebody tells you something about some higher vedantic principles immediately you will understand it because your mind is ready for it you have scored 100% mark in fifth class you go and see the sixth class you will immediately understand it but suppose you are not ready for it then what happens you listen you are impressed you are interested again you listen again you think slowly you will you will become more and more fit for understanding and as your fitness increases you will go deeper into the essence of the vedanta and along with that you you also practice puja 
meditation, karma yoga, bhajan, all these you may practice. And then one day, slowly, you will understand the meaning of the great Vedantic statements. It is called prasankhyana vada. Prasankhyana means slow preparation. It is called dhyana abhyasa. Now, in normal, in the case of normal spiritual seekers, we may not be ready, spiritually we may not be ready to understand Vedantic statements. But we know it is a fact. It is called Paroksha Jnanam or Siddhanta Jnanam. So according to some of these scholars, for example, it is called Parimala Paddhari, it is called Appaya Dekshida wrote Kalpadaru Parimala, which is commentary on Kalpadaru. So in the Bhamadi tradition, Bhamadi was written by Vajaspadi, then Bhamadi Kalpadaru was written by Amalananda, then Kalpadaru Parimala was written by Appaya Dekshida. Appaya Dekshida says, if, suppose you read Vedanta, you read uh, uh, even not Vedanta necessarily, you read com Swamiji's complete works, you read the gospel, you read Holy Mother's teachings. If you are not ready, if you don't have the strong urge, spiritual urge, if you don't have the spiritual fitness to read it, then you won't understand it. But as you pray, meditate, read again and again, think again and again, slowly you will understand the deeper meaning, the implications of what you are reading. So this slow process. So in the case of Sri Ramakrishna, you know what he has been doing all his life? He was doing nothing but meditating on God, on divine matter. They had nothing. In fact, for him, it was difficult not to think of God. So his mind was so immersed in Sadhana Jadushtaya Sambhati and Sarvana Marana Nididhyasana. When Totapari gave him Tattumasi Mahavakya Upadesha, immediately, Agam Brahmasmi, the Anubhudi, sprang in his mind. So these are two Mahavakyas. At the beginning, Tattvamasi, Chandogya, sixth chapter, Sam from Swami Veda. Agam Brahmasmi is Brahadaranega. It is also first chapter. It means, oh, I am the, the realization, Anubhudi Vakya. In between, there is Lakshana Vakya and Anusandhana Vakya. That is, uh, Ayamatma Brahma and Prajnana Brahma. One is from Rigveda, Aitireya, it is Prajnanam Brahma. The other is from Mandukya, it is from Atharva Veda, it is called Ayamatma Brahma. So what it means is, in Sri in in Ramakrishna's context, in his case what happened was, what was so obvious to him, he, it was immediately understood when it came from a teacher. It is called Shabda Aparokshavada. The other one is called Prasankhyanavada. I can give another example. Suppose every day you are driving from Delhi to Agra by this road. Every day you are doing, let's say 50 years. And one day if I ask you, well, are you familiar with that shop or the uh, junction, of, let's say four roads meeting together, junction? Are you familiar with that place? Immediately you will understand what I am talking about. Because you have been driving up and down Agra and Delhi every day, 50 years. Sri Ramakrishna was driving up and down from Agra to Delhi. Means all his life was meditating, just practicing Sadhana Yudhisthya Sambhati, Saravana, Mana, Nididhyasana, Bhajan. And even when, when he was a boy of five years old, he had this experience. You know, the, 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 the white cranes flying against the background of blue skies. The idea of the infinite of the absolute reality suddenly sprang in his mind and he went into Samadhi. So, in the case of Sri Ramakrishna, it was Sabda Parakshavada. In the case of Ramana Maharshi, it is called Prasankhyana Vada. Ramana Maharshi was highly exalted Sathaka. But for common people, we listen every day, we come to Ramakrishna Sama, we attend Puja, we do Karma Yoga, we listen to the Vedan Vedantic ideas. But again, when we go back, we reach our home, we may forget. But when we do this continuously for some years, suddenly we understand oh, it's a real fact. This, this is how it happens. Now, oh, a few important uh, things about Shankaracharya and his work and his contribution. You know, if we have a Vedic philosophy today, it is Shankaracharya's contribution. If you look at the history of, the hermeneutical history of Vedic studies, you find the first available commentary 
that is only a large portion of rigveda samhita it is from skanda swami 6th century bc then in the 5th century bc yaska wrote the niruktam which also is just a, uh, like a descriptive interpretation of some of the mantras and namas names of vedic literature devodanadva jyotanadva deepanadva dusthano va bhavati iti like that one word is devo devakasmat vaishwanara kasma then he gives three or four possible meanings very well, very very short elementary work but and then came bhattabaskara in the 11th century and then mahidhara much later and in 13th century sayana but remember it was shankaracharya who wrote and who gave a philosophy to vedic literature vedic literature never had a philosophy this have to keep in mind all the mahavakyas which constitute the essence of vedic literature they got a meaning only in the writings of shankaracharya before shankaracharya whenever many of these mantras upanishad mantras were commented upon or explained by those who wrote commentaries on samhita portions because samhita portion also includes many upanishad mantras they all wrote this they all interpreted this upanishad mantras as arthavada to give an example you will understand aham brahmas me means i am that absolute per, uh, eternal infinite or pervading immanent transcendental reality brahman the source of the entire creation existence sarvam kridam brahma ila eto vaimani budani jayade the source of everything and the all pervading reality this is a philosophical meaning of aham brahmasmi if you ask a mimamsaka skanda swami or maybe uh, yas kind of this who wrote commentaries on some of these mantras they said if you go on practicing yagnas and yagas dharagni sahidan karma a gragastha and also old married person should practice the vedic rituals every day accompanied by wife and in the presence of fire dharagni sahidan karma then what happens you know if we perform these vedic rituals one day the devada if you are performing the ritual to please indra mitra varuna agni etc one day the devada will admit you into heaven and after some time again you come back to this world but when shankaracharya interpreted any of the upanishad mantras they became a profound eternal transcendental vedanta philosophy that in 19th century sri ramakrishna taught swami vivekananda and swami vivekananda took the western world and today in the western not only western world even in india if people are turning to vedas and vedanta is because shankaracharya wrote this commentary another important thing i i, I want to mention this shankaracharya is advaita there is a strong misunderstanding that advaita is opposed to bhakti in fact the first statement historically that comes in our scriptures that the highest bhakti and the highest gnanam are the same it comes in shankaracharya's commentary on the bhagavad gita 10th chapter 11th or 12th mantra because they are part of vedas are the different versions maicha ananya yogena bhakti hi abhibijarini vivikta deshu sevittum anabhirjana samsadi the subject of discussion in this mantra gita gita sloka is what is the nature of pure devotion means abhibijarini bhakti anan ananya yogena bhajanam bhakti hi the shankaracharya writes na vibhijarana sila abhibijarini bhakti that is the highest bhakti is unwavering steady stable established then he says satya gnanam that bhakti is gnanam itself this comes in shankaracharya's gita bhashya sri ramakrishna repeats same thing the highest bhakti and the highest gnanam are the same at the experience level at the sadhya level it is the same at the sadhana level when you when you are beginner in spiritual life we may think praying to a god in a temple is different from philosophy but 
when you reach the highest experience level, you find the highest philosopher also becomes the most devoted pujari. Because Devada Puja, temple worship, bhakti and devotion, and of course the highest intellectualization of Vedanta philosophy are the same. That's why, you know, today, if you uh, look at the history of the evolution of Hindu pantheon, you find in the, in the uh, Vedic literature, you can find different concepts of the divine. There is pantheism, panetheism, uh, monotheism, monism, and the absolute idealism. All that you find in Veda literature means pantheism means equating this nature with God. Panetheism means you, you, you conceive that within everything there is a spirit. Monotheism means you think of one presiding deity. And polytheism means you believe in different devas and devatas and all that. Monism is closer to Advaita. All that you find in Vedic literature, Indra, Mitram, Varunam, Makdi, Rahu, Adhodivyasa, Suparno, Virutman, Ekam, Sadvipra, Bhagudha, Vadandi, Agnim, Yamam, Matari, Shwanam, Ahu. You find the Rigveda Samhita in the first mandala itself says, Indra, Mitra, Varuna, Agni, all these are different names of the same absolute reality. Now, what Shankaracharya did, you know, he, he evolved a new concept of table worship. I can tell you, if you go to Bedrinath and Kedarnath, close to Chinese border, there is a temple associated with Shankaracharya. If you go to beyond Bangladesh, Tribura, Tribureshri temple, that is also associated with Shankaracharya. If you go to Dwaraka, extreme west of India, Dwaraka. And if you go to Kanyakumari or Kanji or Shingeri, there also you find. And middle of India, Puri, Dwaraka, Badri, Kedar, all these you find. So, in most of the temples you find, there are some deities, Shiva, Vishnu, Devi, Ganapati, Subramanya and so on. Shankaracharya wrote, did not spare a single deity anywhere. Wherever he went, he stood in front of the deity and chanted a uh, devotional hymn, which his disciples memorized and wrote down later. You, have, you can see the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, where Sri Ramakrishna talks about how an Avadhuta came to Dikshineshwar. He took a dip in the Ganga, did not take a regular bath, uh, water dripping down his body. He stood right in front of Divine Mother Bhavatarini and chanted a a hymn, uh, according to some writers, not yet confirmed, it's called Devi, Devi Aparadakshamavana Stotram, we don't know. And he chanted a month, uh, this sloka, this hymn to Divine Mother, and the whole temple shook because Ravadhuda was a practitioner of Advaita in his life. So when he chanted a devotional hymn with full fervor, he could establish complete identity with divine. Now, Shankaracharya's unique contribution to devotional philosophy, that's what I want to refer to now. One is Panja Devada Puja, the other is Sharmada Sthavanam. Now, uh, uh, you can find uh, this uh, in the Panja Devada Puja, uh, the, the, the Sangalpa, that is Adityam Bigam Vishnu Gananadham Maheshwaram Panja Yeknya Varonityam Grihastha Panja Pujayet. Aditya Ambigam Vishnum Gananatham Maheshwaram. Surya, uh, Mother, Divine Mother Ambiga, Vishnu, uh, then Maheshwara, and Ganapati. So, if you go to many of the Hindu temples, Hindu homes in many places, you find a small box where all these deities, or some of these deities, either Vishnu, Shiva, Gana, all these are mentioned here. It actually started by Shankara, they do Pancha Devata Puja. Every Grihastha should practice Pancha Devata Puja. Remember, all the great Vedantis like Madhusudra Saraswati, who wrote Advaita Siddhi. Or before him, uh, uh, Chitsuka Acharya, who wrote Tattu Pratipika. Or uh, Sikhasa, who wrote Khandana Khanda Khadya. All the cutthroat Advaitic dialecticians, they were praying every day to their own family deity. And some of you must have heard this interesting story. 
uh, into, in, in Sri Ramakrishna's life. Tata Buri, one day, made for no Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, when Sri Ramakrishna was singing bhajans, Divine Mothers, you know, are we making chapatis? But actually the greatest chapati maker in the world, as he was Shankaracharya himself, he was making chapati all his life. 68 devotional poems. Saundari Lagri, Ananda Lagri, Bhavani Ishtagam, Chadu Sashti Vajara Buja Stotram. Of course, the list is so long that I cannot really mention it right now. So what it means is, uh, uh, it is impossible for us to mention one area which Shankaracharya did not even touch or conceive of. Now, coming to uh, 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 this Sri Ramakrishna's own teaching, Sri Ramakrishna, again and again, whenever he talks about Vijnana, Vijnanam or Jnanam, he goes on repeating this again and again, you know, Vijnanam and Jnanam. Vijnanam is Shastra Anusaranam, Shastra Anubhuti, according to Shankaracharya's Jnana Vijnana Dukta Ma Kudastu Vijidendriya Yukta Itichudhe Yogi Samaloshta Asma Kanchanaka You find these words in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. In that, Shankaracharya himself writes Jnanam Shastrokta Padarthanam Parijnanam Vijnanam Tu Shastra Taka Tathaiva Swanu Bhavakaran There are people who will tell you that Shankaracharya did not accept Vijnana. But actually, this Shankaracharya says, Jnanam, unless it is specially mentioned, in the ordinary sense, could mean Paroksha Jnanam or scriptural understanding, Siddhanta Jnanam. Vijnanam is Swanubhava Karanam. That is Bhashikara statement in the sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Jnanam Vijnana Tuttatna Kudasto Vijidendriya Yukta Itichade Yogi Sama Loshtasma Kanchanaka. And Bhashigara says, Jnanam Shastrokta Vadarthanam Parijnanam. Means, it is the understanding of the words mentioned in scriptures. Vijnanam tu Shastra Taka Tathaiva Swanibhava Karanam. Vijnanam means internalizing, practicing what we learn from books in our own everyday life. That's why Bhashigara says, Prat Brahmatma Vijnanath Sarva Loka Vyavakharanam Satyitu Vubhuttihi Yadha Sopnadushtra Saiva Prat Prabodhath You find, you know, a dreamer can only experience dream objects. He understands that it is only a dream only when he comes out of the dream experience, when he looks back. Then only he will understand that it was only a dream. Within dream, dream objects are real for him. Like that, we all should work in this world as if the world is real. Then practice karma yoga. Then we should practice bhakti, puja, sravanam. All this we should practice. And then when we get this vijnanam, pragmatma vijnanam, when we get that, then you will understand that the absolute reality at the highest level is one attributeless, formless, or pervading reality. Then also, even Advaitin, even a Videha Jivan Mukta, a Jivan Mukta continues going to temples. A Jivan Mukta doesn't, uh, doesn't stop going to temples. Suppose you become a professor in English language or become a physicist, a great scientist. Do you, will you stop reading books on physics? Because you have become a PhD scholar. You continue reading books on physics. Like that, a person who slowly begins with rituals, then philosophy, then experience, and when he, even he becomes a Jeevan Mukta, then also he, he will be living in this world as if the world is real. So, Brahma Satyam Vigan Mithya Jeevo Brahma Ivanapara, this is a statement. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Sloka Arthena Pravakshyami Yaduktam Ganda Godi Bihi. Brahma Satyam Vigan Mithya Jeevo Brahma Ivanapara. Vigan Mithya, that is also highly misunderstood. One of the most terrible misunderstandings about Advaita is, Advaita tells you, you are not sitting there, I am not sitting here, there is no mic here, there is absolute rubbish. 
what Advaita tells you is, you will not be sitting here after 100 years. Maybe after one hour. Because everything that changes is not absolutely unreal, but not absolutely real. Because in order to qualify for the status of absolute reality called what you call the Paramatthika Sattva. It should be Sarvikara Adhida, Trikara Abadhida, and Avasthatri Abadhida. It should be beyond any of the changes. Mean Jayade, Asti, Vardhade, Viparinamade, Apakshyade, Vinashyade. Something coming to existence, existing for some time, growing, evolving, decaying, dying, and disappearing, and re emerging. Six changes. What is the absolute reality? The Paramarthika Sattva will be beyond all these changes. It remains the same in the past, present and future. It beyond time dimension, time, space and causation. Again, it will be experienced the same in the, in the Jagra, Sopna, Susupti, the three states of consciousness. In the waking, in dream and dreamless or deep sleep states. And Brahman is only absolute reality because Brahman never came into existence because there was no time when Brahman did not exist. And there will be no time when Brahman will not exist. Everything else in this world, including my shirt, this mic, and the chair in front of you, will be there, but will not be there all the time. That's the meaning of Mithyatum or Maya. Actually, I don't have time, but as an intellectual entertainment, I can give you five definitions of Mithyatum in Vedanta and how these ideas were misinterpreted and uh, rejected and refuted by Vyasatirtha in his Nyayamura, one of the most difficult dialectical works in Dvaita tradition. Vyasatirtha was a great opponent of Madhusudana Saraswati, who wrote, who, you know, who wrote a commentary, Dwayda the Siddhi, which he, he defended Vyasadirtha's allegations. Five definitions. One is, it comes in Panchabadiga, Sada Satta Anadhigarna Tungva Mithyattu. That, which if it is indescribable, it, is, can, it cannot be called real or unreal. Sanna, Pyasanna, Pibhuyad, Migano, Shankaracharya himself writes in Vivekacu Damani. What cannot be considered to be eternally unreal or eternally real. It cannot be absolutely real or absolutely unreal. That is Mithya. This world is there. That's why we are living in this world. But again, it will, it will not be there all the time. Therefore, it is not absolute reality. The second and third definitions, the first one is Panchabhadika by Padmapada. The second and third definition, these three, de the two definitions are from Panchabhadika Vivarana by Prakasa Medhi. That is, Prasanno, Pradivanno Bhadu, Traikalika Nishedha Pradiyogitam Va Mithyatum and Jnana uh, Nivartitam Va Mithyatum. See, when you see uh, the Reju and you mistake the Reju for a Sarpa, the Sarpa doesn't really exist in the Reju, either the past, present and future. Like that, if you look at this world, if you look at the, the look at gold, and if you look at from the standpoint, the empirical point of view, then is a golden ornament. When you look at gold from an uh, uh, absolutistic point of view, it is gold. A pot, for a pot can be perceived either a pot or clay. You know, goldsmith doesn't see the ornament; it looks at the quality of the gold. A pot maker sees only the pot. So, yeah, but he sees the pot, but he can also see that behind the pot, there is something which is more real, that is clay. The, uh, uh, so, when you realize this absolute reality, when you get the vidya, when you get jnanam, something goes away. When you get light, somebody runs away. And what runs away when light comes is darkness. What runs away when, in night, when knowledge comes is ignorance. The fourth definition, definition is Swasayan Nishtha Atyanda Chitsugi Chitsuga Chari Tattu Pradipika Swasayan Nishtha Atyanda Bhava Pradyogitam Va Mithyatu Again, even, where, even, even 
when you perceive a sarpa a snake in the red zoo when you perceive it even at that time itself in itself it doesn't really exist and sat vivekta dwa mithya so when you realize the absolute reality you become aware of the true nature and then what is asat goes away one of the fundamental problems in advaita is and this i want to emphasize and this has happened sri ramakrishna made it very clear this should be very clearly understood very often the word avidya is misunderstood and again frequently vyavaharika satta is misunderstood to be asat in fact not only all of us even ramanuja wrote sapta uh, anubhuti vada seven uh, seven uh, ne- not negations but uh, imponderables of uh, advaita philosophy of uh, avidya so uh, the main problem is very often when advaitins tell you that this world is vyavaharika satta only they don't clearly understand the meaning of vyavaharika satta vyavaharika satta is relative reality but very often those who criticize advaita begin to imagine especially those who have not read the original books that should be understood remember if an engineer criticizes medicine don't listen to him if a doctor criticizes engineering don't listen to him you know if i criticize music i don't know anything about music don't listen to me like that for every shastram you should be qualified to talk about it i don't mean to say that everyone should study sanskrit become experts in sanskrit language study all the bhasha not at all look at swami adbhutananda ji swami adbhutananda ji sri ramakrishna's guru sri ramakrishna shishya disciple he was not a sanskrit scholar but he had attained the spiritual qualifications for studying and and understanding vedanta sadhana chatushta sampat when you have these qualifications your mind becomes pure with a pure mind if you read vedantic books you will understand the essence of advaita vedanta shastra acharya shastra acharya upadeshehi samskritam manaha veda vedanta darshane yogyam bhashikara says those who may not have read uh, 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 bhashyas or sanskrit classics or anything but still if they have sincere learning what what guru mara has called vyakulata for spiritual progress that vyakulata will make you spiritually will make your mind spiritually fit for understanding vedanta this is an important thing to remember what we find today is people try to misunderstand advaita to be a concept advaita is not a concept advaita is only an abhuti sutya yuktya swanubhutya bhashigara goes on shouting all over his books like a sloganary you should listen to scriptures you should use your own reasoning power to analyze and then that's not enough you should bring into your own life experience so and for bringing into life experience our mind should be ready for that not in terms of intellectual or iq uh, uh, development but in terms of purity and sincerity so any person who has a sincere desire to understand advaita will immediately understand the fact that jagat mithyatvam is pure common sense pure common sense if somebody tells you you have lost your job that state of joblessness is not going to be a permanent situation you will get a job next month like that everything in this world undergoes changes and anything that undergoes change cannot be absolutely real but is not absolutely unreal either people often misunderstand that when when shankaracharya says that the world is mithya they think shankaracharya said this world is unreal absolute nonsense this is what you should understand that's why pure advaita is simple common sense absolute common sense if that's why guru mara says put a little advaita in your pocket and live in this world you you need not take out all the time if guru mara himself 
kept it under lock and key for some time. You know, Guru Maharaj Sri Ramakrishna taught to Swamiji this, uh, this Advedic, gave this Advedic experience. Then Swamiji, Sri Ramakrishna wanted Swamiji to work in this world, to go on with his spiritual mission. And of course, you know, the last day, Swamiji understood. Now the key is out, the box is open, and he left this world, 39 years. Like that, pure Advaita, when the concept of Jagad Mithyantum is on just pure common sense. Swamiji says, the world is a gymnasium for us to work out our karma. This world is, is a place where we can live, work, and slowly evolve in spiritual life. Karma nishthayaha chitta suddhi dvarana pushartha hedhuta na swadhandriyana jnana nishthadu swadhandriyana pushartha hedhuku anyan apeksha. Bhashagara says in the Gita Bhashya, he says, karma nishtha, any good activity, any activity without a selfish motive, it can slowly, gradually purify our mind and such a purified mind will instinctively understand the truth of Advaita. This, if you read the lives of our great disciples, Sri Ramakrishna, not only so, many other direct disciples, Lethuri, Anandji and others, you can see the logic and the, the reality that uh, Advaita is pure common sense. Even the idea that Jagat Mithyatam is a pure common sense, it is just a way of explaining the world in the, in the most reasonable, logical way. I have tried to give a very, very uh, elementary interpretation. And with this, I want to conclude. Thank you. I should thank uh, Sandat Manandaji to compress within a few minutes to give what I should take, what it may take me several hours to deal with. Thank you. Namaskar.